ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो नारायणाय ओम आनंदमयी चैतन्यमयी सत्यमयी परमे थैंक यू वेरी मच रुक्मिणी जी एंड ऑल ब्रदर सन्यासी साधक एट द शिवानंद रिट्रीट सेंटर फॉर थ्री डेज ऑफ वंडरफुल ब्लिसफुल satsang and inner sharing uh, today i will con- conclude as rukmini ji said this series on the divine mother and the integral yoga of shri aurobindo with the last talk on the divine mother and the supramental manifestation on earth in this talk will really continue from the first day to talk about the mother and her life and work with sri aurobindo so where we stopped on the first day we discussed the mother's contributions to sri aurobindo's yoga and i mentioned the contributions were these four an emphasis on preparing the lower levels and working on matter this is related to the fact that when the mother came to pondicherry shri aurobindo was in a process of trying to bring the influence of what he called super mind or vigyana consciousness into the cosmic consciousness of the universal mind and he was not succeeding he found that whatever he did had a temporary influence and afterwards it reverted back to whatever was happening and the mother had already had an experience of the involution of that power at the base of matter and she proposed to sri aurobindo that they work on the lower planes of the life energy pranamaya plane and the annamaya plane the planes of life and matter and prepare them create an opening so that it becomes easier for those higher planes to descend that was her first contribution the second one was that of the full emergence of the psychic being as we discussed in the indian systems the notion of the soul as an inner presence is already there it is known as the antaratman the antaratman is spoken about as the reincarnating element in us it is also the element that travels from life to life and that actually makes a, a you know journey within time and space but the influence of the antaratman on the nature on prakriti on the sheets of the annamaya prakriti pranamaya manomaya prakriti is not that well discussed in the indian systems this is something the mother brought that the psychic being as she called it can actually have a direct influence of transformation on the inner mind vital and physical planes of the individual the third one contribution was the emphasis on the surrender to the divine mother as the power to prepare the transformation of nature so as i discussed last time shri aurobindo sadhana was conducted as a surrender to shri krishna atma samarpan to shri krishna it was really the yoga of the gita as he understood it but he f- figured out through the contact with the mother that the power that intervenes between the planes of vidya and avidya what he was calling the vigyana is really capable of preparing the ground if the shakti of vigyana is invoked and that is really what he calls the divine mother the divine mother in a spiritual sense is the shakti of the vigyana plane vigyana shakti and he felt or he experienced 
that the mother was an embodiment, Mira Alfasa was an embodiment of that plane come into this life to effect that particular change. Finally, her contribution was the organization of the ashram community towards a collective yoga. And this is a very important point because this leads to the idea of the possibility of a collective realization of this new plane of consciousness that they were trying to bring down in their own sadhana. We discussed yesterday this cosmology that is carried in this chart of Sri Aurobindo. Uh, this is the developed cosmology. It evolved over time, but ultimately the seeds of it were already there when the mother came. And I bring this to your notice again to show you the vertical planes, what Sri Aurobindo called the ladder of existence. And here you can see the Vidya consciousness is consists of Sat, Chit, Ananda, and Vijnana. So these are existence, consciousness, bliss, and supermind. And underneath it is the Avidya consciousness consisting of Annam, Prana, Mana. And this Mana plane rising into the cosmic planes above the human mind into what Sri Aurobindo classified as certain stages of ascent into the higher mind, the illumined mind, the intuition, and finally the overmind. Now these terms, particularly the overmind, was not used by Sri Aurobindo and he didn't even properly know what these planes were when the mother came in 1920. In fact, at that time, he felt that he was in direct contact with the lowest rung of the supermind. And that is what he was trying to make influence the cosmic consciousness of the higher aspects of cosmic mind. And as I said, he was failing at that. So with the mother's help, he continued to prepare the lower planes. The mother says, we came down to the vital and the physical at that point. Um, we also looked at the sadhana of Sri Aurobindo in terms of the seven quartets, Sapta Chatushtaya, yesterday. And I also pointed out in yesterday's afternoon satsang or workshop, how the change that took place was that the sadhana of the Shakti Chatushtaya, the quartet of the Divine Mother, took central place, partly because of that same reason that I discussed, the yoga turned towards a surrender to the Vijnana Shakti as the primary motive, power of the entire sadhana. Now, this process, as this process was taking place, Sri Aurobindo had a few disciples around him. And the mother went into seclusion. She was not out there. She did not become a common uh, you know, part of the life of uh, Sri Aurobindo and his disciples. She would come out for some of the evening talks, but mostly she stayed indoors pursuing intensive sadhana. But in 1926, so for, for three, six years, she was behind the screen. And in 1926, something significant started happening in the ashram of Sri Aurobindo. On November 24, 1926, Sri Aurobindo declared the realization or descent of the overmind into his consciousness, and ultimately into his physical being. And with that, he withdrew to focus on the last stage, which is the stage of the supermind. We also discussed this a little bit this morning, and I'm pointing to the fact that, and also yesterday, I pointed to the fact of the three transformations, the psychic transformation, the spiritual transformation, and the supramental transformation. And this may be considered the second or spiritual transformation that took place in Sri Aurobindo at this time, leading the way towards the third or supramental transformation. Sri Aurobindo withdrew for this, 
because he needed to give intense energy towards that and he asked mira to step in front and take charge of the ashram and this is the point from where the mother becomes in fact the mother the term the mother is used from this time so she is really known as the mother from this time and she became the person in charge of the ashram shri aurobindo was available through correspondence and four darshans a year now leading up to this point there was a certain kind of spiritual action of the mother that led to it and this is what she says in 1926 i had begun a sort of over mental creation so this very plain the plain the highest plain actually again the term over mind was used only after 1926 in 26 shri aurobindo thought the lowest plane of the supermind had descended into him and it is only after a few months that he said that in fact what had descended was still part of the avidya it was the highest plane of the cosmic mind and he used the term overmind and it is this plane which is the proper residence of the cosmic gods and so we also discussed this during our satsang how each individual is actually an ansha of some particular god or goddess or god goddess pair and this plane is where these particular relations are established so the mother was trying to make these relations more manifest on the surface by creating a over mental creation in the subtle physical layer i had begun a sort of over mental creation to make each god descend into a being at the ashram so she was trying to put each person at the ashram in contact with the deity who was behind them there they were an ansha the soul was an ansha there was an extraordinary upward curve i saw krishna join himself to shri aurobindo as part of this process i told him this is what i have seen Yes I know he replied I have decided to retire to my room and you will take charge of the people so this is in a sense part of her action that took place at this time now shri aurobindo says in explanation of this entire process what we've already discussed everyone's inner being is born in the amsha or portion of some devata or god and another inmate of the ashram from that pa- pa- that time by the name of narayan prasad describes this period between the end of 1926 and the end of 1927 the mother was trying to bring down the overmind gods into our beings but the adharas were not ready to bear them on the contrary there were violent reactions those some had very good experiences and the reason for this is as we've already discussed it needs the psychic being to come to the front the nature is not prepared to hold we also talked about dharana shakti that dharana shakti is not there in the in the normal nature prakriti to hold the power of the gods so as a result this action only really had some positive effect in the case of shri aurobindo and the mother herself the shri aurobindo the mother says shri aurobindo said it is a creation of the overmind we want to establish the supermind upon earth with my inner consciousness i understood a few hours later the creation didn't exist anymore and we started a new on other foundations So this is what the mother says now the other thing that happened which she doesn't say is that just as krishna joined himself to shri aurobindo in a, in her words the divine four divine goddesses started manifesting in the mother this is the point from which she is called the mother 
and also the cosmic mahashakti with the four emanations maheshwari mahakali mahalakshmi and maha saraswati began manifesting in the mother aurobindo ghosh was known as shri aurobindo from this point that's where the point from which he also started signing his name as shri aurobindo and mira alfasa was known as the mother the, this was also the beginning of the ashram with the mother as its active leader in 1927 shri aurobindo wrote a number of letters and an essay which was compiled into the book called the mother short book this established the fact that the four cosmic mahashaktis were manifesting as emanations of the mother from this period the focus of shri aurobindo's integral yoga for his residents became from this point surrender in their inner and outer movements to the mother so that she could prepare mold and transform their nature towards the supramental consciousness this is from the book the mother the one whom we adore as the mother is the divine conscious force that dominates all existence one and yet so many sided that to follow her movement is impossible even for the quickest mind and for the freest and most vast intelligence the mother is the consciousness and force of the supreme and far above all she creates but something of her ways can be seen and felt through her embodiments and the more seizable because more defined and limited temperament and action of the goddess forms in whom she consents to be manifest to her creatures there are three ways of being of the mother of which you can become aware when you enter into touch of oneness with the conscious force that upholds us and the universe transcendent the original supreme shakti she stands above the worlds and links the creation to the ever unmanifest mystery of the supreme universal the cosmic mahashakti she creates all these beings and contains and enters supports and conducts all these million processes and forces individual she embodies the power of these two vaster ways of her existence makes them living and near to us and mediates between the human personality and the divine nature four great aspects of the mother four of her leading powers and personalities have stood in front in her guidance of this universe and in her dealings with the terrestrial play and i will not read the rest of it because i've already read it it's the description of the four cosmic mahashaktis maheshwari mahakali mahalakshmi and maha saraswati the shri aurobindo ashram began at this point and the mother took charge of the ashram and shri aurobindo says about her action on the disciples when someone is accepted accepted the mother sends out something of herself to him and this is with him wherever he goes and is always in connection with her being here and this i can attest to the fact that anybody who calls on the mother sincerely she sends something to that person that stays with that person it's part of her existence an emanation of her existence which is a direct link with her shri aurobindo says the mother by her gaze looks directly at the soul and by her touch connects the surface consciousness to the soul the activities of the ashram which became the point of contact between the disciples and the mother were a morning pranam a uh, something called blessings she would give a uh, flowers to people a meditation collective meditation for some time a soup distribution a joint darshan with shri aurobindo four times in the year and later after shri aurobindo passed away a balcony darshan apart from this of course there was direct contact with every department where she would actually take 
active interest in everything that was going on and give direction. And she offered her blessings through charged flowers that she called states of consciousness that were offered to whoever was in contact with her. Sri Aurobindo says, the mother by, her, by the very nature of her work had to identify herself with the sadhakas to support all their difficulties, to receive into herself all the poison in their nature, to take up besides all the difficulties of the universal earth nature, including the possibility of death and disease in order to fight them out. If she had not done that, not a single sadhak would have been able to practice this yoga. The divine has to put on humanity in order that the human being may rise to the divine. It is a simple truth, but nobody in the ashram seems able to understand that the divine can do that and yet remain different from them, can still remain the divine. Now the ashram began growing, and you can get some sense of the statistics of the ashram. This is the inner courtyard of the ashram before Sri Aurobindo or the mother passed away. In 1926, there were 24 residents. In 27, there were 36 residents. In 1930, there were 85 residents. In 34, 150. In 1938, 172. In 1942, it jumped to 350, and in 1950, 750. Now, these big jumps are very significant, and they have to do with the Second World War, which was a extremely significant event for the entire Earth, but also for Sri Aurobindo and the mother, and the kind of action that they undertook at that point. The mother writes in 1930 in a letter, the ashram is becoming more and more interesting, a more and more interesting institution. We have now acquired our 21st house. The number of paid workers of the ashram, laborers and servants, has reached 60 or 65. And the number of ashram members varies between 85 and 100. Five cars, 12 bicycles, four sewing machines, a dozen typewriters, many garages, an automobile repair workshop, an electric service, a building service, sewing departments, European and Indian tailors, embroideresses, etc., a library and reading room containing several thousand volumes, a photographic service, general stores containing a wide variety of goods, nearly all imported from France, large gardens for flowers, vegetables and fruits, a dairy, a bakery, etc., etc. You can see it is no small affair. Now, after this, of course, they intervened, as I just said, the Second World War. And we have seen how the mother declared that during the First World War, she was very powerfully involved in the war in an occult way. Her whole body was surrendered, and each limb of her body was a battlefield. She was actually experiencing the battle going on inside her. Similarly, a very similar kind of extremely active presence and power of Sri Aurobindo and the mother was involved in the Second World War. In 1940, Sri Aurobindo and the mother declared themselves in support of the Allies and contributed to the war fund. Now, this was seen by many people in India as something not so good because Sri Aurobindo was a nationalist who was against the British government. He had fought against the British as an anti colonial agent. But when it came to the war, he said that this is completely different. It's nothing to do with India becoming free. India must become free. But the stakes involved in this war 
are much greater than that of being against the British for the Indian independence. So he gave a declaration to support the fact that he was uh, fully in favor of the Allies. He said, we feel that not only is this a battle waged in just self-defense and in defense of the nations threatened with the world domination of Germany and the Nazi system of life, but that it is a defense of civilization and its highest attained social, cultural, and spiritual values and of the whole future of humanity. To this cause, our support and sympathy will be unswerving Whatever may happen, we look forward to the victory of Britain and as the eventual result, an era of peace and union among nations and a better and more secure world order. It's a very significant statement. And somebody sometime afterwards asked Sri Aurobindo, what do you think really happened in the two world wars? And he said, in the First World War, the backbone of monarchy was broken. It, we entered into a democratic world. And in the Second World War, the backbone of aggressive nationalism was broken. And that is really what the whole battle with Nazi Germany was about. Unfortunately, we must realize that these forces have not gone away. They are with us today in some way even more powerfully making a reappearance. And that's why it's very important to note and take attention, pay attention to what the stakes of these battles are. Sri Aurobindo also said about the battle, I affirm to you most strongly that this is the mother's war. You should not think of it as a fight for certain nations against others or even for India. It is a struggle for an ideal that has to establish itself on earth in the life of humanity for a truth that has yet to realize itself fully and against a darkness and a falsehood that we are trying to, that are trying to overwhelm the earth and mankind in the immediate future. The mother called it a war against the Lord of falsehood. You remember the mother talks about the four archangels and the four inverse powers, dark powers. The power of the archangel of light, the opposite is the demon of darkness, of life, death, of joy, sorrow, and of truth, the falsehood. This is the Lord of falsehood. The Lord of falsehood is best manifest as magnified ego, magnified collective ego. Ego is that which stands as a falsehood against the divine truth of all human beings and all of, all of nature, all of earth. That divinity is defied in the name of individual and collective egoism. That is the Lord of falsehood. In, on December 5, 1950, Sri Aurobindo left his body. That is the year of his Mahasamadhi. And the mother continued leading the ashram. And in 1956, she declared the descent of the supermind. <clears throat> the descent and manifestation of the supermind, which is what Sri Aurobindo was trying to achieve. Uh, throughout his life, particularly from 1926 to 1950, he was bringing the supramental consciousness down, but it did not fully manifest in his life, in his body. But in February, 19, February 29, 1956, the mother made a declaration afterwards about something that happened that night. This evening, the divine presence concrete and material, was there present amongst you. And she was at the ashram playground. This photograph is taken from the ashram playground where there is an undivided map of India. 
she was sitting underneath that. I had a form of living gold bigger than the universe, and I was facing a huge and massive golden door which separated the world from the divine. As I looked at the door, I knew and willed in a single movement of consciousness that the time has come. And lifting with both hands a mighty golden hammer, I struck one blow, one single blow on the door, and the door was shattered to pieces. Then the supramental light and force and consciousness rushed down upon the earth in an uninterrupted flow. Now, this golden door we may consider as something that is repeatedly spoken about even in Sri Aurobindo's writings, and he refers to the Isha Upanishad and the golden lid that separates the Vidya and the Avidya. This is what he calls the lid of the overmind. And that, in a sense, is what he was trying to break. And in the mother, the last paragraph, which I have read, even this, today I read it, he uses the term to rend the lid and tear the covering and prepare the vessel. This lid is what she's talking about. It is the lid that stands between the mind and the supermind. Now, one may ask the question, if she's talking of such a tremendous apocalyptic event in an occult sense of the descent of supramental light, how are we not experiencing? Where is it? What is happening to it now? Even in her own time, the mother declared what exactly was going on. She says, the atmosphere of the earth is too contrary to the magnificence of the supreme consciousness and veils it almost constantly. From time to time, it can show and express itself. But then again, this inconscient atmosphere veils it. It was like that when in 1956, the supramental power came down upon earth. It was coming in torrents of light, wonderful light and force and power. And from the earth, big waves of deep blue in conscience came and swallowed it up. All the force that was coming down was swallowed up. And it is again from inside the inconscience that it has to work itself through. That is why things take so much time here. We may actually see that from that period, from the 60s to now, there's a tremendous acceleration. We cannot say that we are entering into some kind of golden age. We may say that we are entering into an even more difficult time today. But we may also conceive that that is the action of something, a force, a power that is accelerating the yoga of the earth. Just like the churning of the ocean that threw up the poison first before something divine could emerge from underneath. The mother speaks of an experience in 1958, on November 5, 1958, that she had. At the bottom of the inconscience, most hard and rigid and narrow and stifling, I struck upon an almighty spring that cast me up forthwith into a formless, limitless, vast, vibrating with the seeds of a new world. And she explains, the experience of November 5th was a new step in the construction of the link between the two worlds. I was indeed projected into the very origin of the supramental creation, all that warm gold, that living tremendous power, that sovereign peace. Now. The mother's own yoga at that point entered a very special phase. 
what she calls the yoga of the cells. She in, in fact says that the realization of the mind and the life, the, anna, the manomaya purusha and the manomaya prakriti, as well as the pranamaya purusha and prakriti, was already complete. It was already re had received the supramental light, but the physical hadn't. So she says she cast aside her mind and her vital. They were out. And she became just a physical being. And that is where she started all over again the sadhana of the body, of the cells. Now, to understand what is the body uh, sadhana of the body, we can go back to the mother's prayers and meditations. Already she was experiencing something of this kind. And a symbol or a, a kind of hint can be seen in her prayer of November 26, 1915. And here's what she says. The entire consciousness immersed in divine contemplation, the whole being enjoyed a supreme and vast felicity. Then was the physical body seized first in its lower members and then the whole of it by a sacred trembling, which made all personal limits fall away little by little, even in the most material sensation. The being grew in greatness progressively, methodically, breaking down every barrier, shattering every obstacle, that it might contain and manifest a force and a power which increased ceaselessly in immensity and intensity. It was as if a progressive dilation of the cells until there was a complete identification with the earth. The body of the awakened consciousness was the terrestrial globe moving harmoniously in ethereal space. And the consciousness knew that its global body was thus moving in the arms of the universal being, and it gave itself, it abandoned itself to it in an ecstasy of peaceful bliss. Then it felt that its body was absorbed in the body of the universe and one with it. The consciousness became the consciousness of the universe, immobile in its totality, moving infinitely in its internal complexity. The consciousness of the universe sprang towards the divine in an ardent aspiration, a perfect surrender. So this kind of a experience that is an experience of the body cells uniting with the earth and uniting with the cosmos was something that Sri Aurobind, that the mother had intimations of even during her prayers and meditations in 1915. And it is these kinds of experiences that continue multiplying after 1956 or so. She says, transformation implies that all this purely material arrangement is replaced by an arrangement of concentration of force, having certain types of different vibrations, substituting each organ by a center of conscious energy moved by a conscious will and directed by a movement coming from above, from higher regions. These are the chakras. So the supramental consciousness is directly going to act through the chakras, which will take the place of the organs, as it were. You must have at your disposal the original vibrations of that which is symbolized by these organs. And you must slowly gather together all these energies in your body and change each organ into a center of conscious energy, which will replace the symbolic movement by the real one. To have a form with qualities which will not be exactly those we know, but will be much superior, a form that one naturally dreams to see changeable. As the expression of your face changes with your feelings, so the body will change, not the form, but within the same form, in accordance with what you want to express with your body. It can become very concentrated, very developed, very luminous, very quiet, with a perfect plasticity, 
with a perfect elasticity and then a lightness in accordance with one's will. Now, I will uh, read this. Um, the principles for the integral transformation, according to the mother, these are the principles. The first one is unity. The distinction between the divine and the undivine exists indeed for practical purposes. For there is nothing that is not divine. And in a larger view, it is as meaningless verbally as the distinction between natural and supernatural. For all things that are, are natural. All things are in nature, and all things are in God. But for practical purposes, there is a real distinction. The second principle is surrender. What is going to happen, I don't know. The body is not concerned about it. It is all the time like this. The mother opens her hands with palms upwards. All the time, what thou willest, Lord, what thou willest. It has become my only refuge. The mother's mantra of surrender of the cells since 1958 was Om Namo Bhagavate. She felt every cell of her body was uttering that mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate, all the time. Third principle, sincerity. Sincerity means to lift all the movements of the being to the level of the highest consciousness and realization already attained. To be perfectly sincere, it is indispensable not to have any preference, any desire, any attraction, any dislike, any sympathy or antipathy, any attachment, any repulsion. One must live in a total integral vision of things in which everything is in its place and one has the same attitude towards all things, the attitude of the vision of truth. And the final principle, aspiration, a flame burning in the core of the being which takes position of you and which is so powerful that nothing else in the world has any importance anymore. So, since we are running out of time, um, should I stop here or can I continue for a little bit more? Okay. So, the mother, this continues this process and in 1962, there was another stage. The mother says on 12th April 1962, Suddenly in the night, I woke with the full awareness of what we could call the yoga of the world. The supreme love was manifesting through big pulsations, and each pulsation was bringing the world further in its manifestation. It was the formidable pulsations of the eternal, stupendous love, only love. Each pulsation of the love was carrying the universe further in its manifestation. And there was the certitude that what is to be done is done, and that supramental manifestation is realized. Everything was impersonal. Nothing was individual. This was going on and on and on and on. The certitude that what is to be done is done. All the results of the falsehood had disappeared. Death was an illusion. Sickness was an illusion. Ignorance was an illusion. Something that had no reality, no existence. Only love and love and love and love. Immense, formidable, stupendous, carrying everything. And how to express it in the world? It was like an impossibility because of the contradiction, but then it came. You have accepted that the world should know the supramental truth, and it will be expressed totally, integrally. Yes, yes, the thing is done. Now, I don't say anything more about the mother's yoga of the cells. With this, we come to the end of that particular aspect. There is a lot more that can be said about that journey of the mother. But 
she also felt that the next stage, if it is to be manifest, has to be collective. And in 1954, she expressed a dream. There should be somewhere on earth a place which no nation can claim as its own, where all human beings of goodwill who have a sincere aspiration could live freely as citizens of the world and obey one single authority, that of the supreme truth. A place of peace, concord, and harmony where all the fighting instincts of man would be used exclusively to conquer the causes of his suffering and miseries, to surmount his weaknesses and ignorances, ignorance, to triumph over his limitations and incapacities, a place where the needs of the spirit and the concern for progress would take precedence over the satisfaction of desires and passions, the search for pleasure and material enjoyment. In this place, children would be able to grow and develop integrally without losing contact with their souls. Education would be given not for passing examinations or obtaining certificates and posts, but to enrich existing faculties and bring forth new ones. In this place, titles and positions would be replaced by opportunities to serve and organize. The bodily needs of each one would be equally provided for, and intellectual, moral, and spiritual superiority would be expressed in the general organization, not by an increase in, in the pleasures and powers of life, but by an increase in the duties and responsibilities. Beauty in all its artistic forms, Painting, sculpture, music, literature would be equally accessible to all. The ability to share in the joy it brings would be limited only by the capacities of each one and not by social or financial position. For in this ideal place, money would no longer be the sovereign lord. Individual worth would have a far greater importance than that of material wealth and social standing. Their work would not be a way to earn one's living, but a way to express oneself and to develop one's capacities and possibilities while being of service to the community as a whole, which for its own part would provide for each individual subsistence and sphere of action. In short, it would be a place where human relationships which are normally based almost exclusively on competition and strife, would be replaced by relationships of emulation in doing well, of collaboration and real brotherhood. The earth is certainly not ready to realize such an ideal, for mankind does not yet possess the necessary knowledge to understand and accept it, nor the indispensable conscious force to execute it. That is why I call it a dream. Yet, this dream is on the way to becoming a reality. That is exactly what we are doing on a small scale in proportion to our modest means. The achievement is indeed far from being perfect. It is progressive. Little by little, we advance towards our goal, which we hope one day we shall be able to hold before the world as a practical and effective means of coming out of the present chaos in order to be born into a more true, more harmonious new life. And in 1972, the mother founded another international community with these ideals. This is Auroville. You can see this event of the founding of Auroville the city of future realization. The charter of Auroville. Auroville belongs to nobody in particular. Auroville belongs to humanity as a whole. But to live in Auroville, one must be a willing servitor of the divine consciousness. Auroville will be the place of an unending education, of constant progress, and a youth that never ages. 
Auroville wants to be the bridge between the past and the future, taking advantage of all discoveries from without and from within, Auroville will boldly spring towards future realizations. Auroville will be a site of material and spiritual researches for a living embodiment of an actual human unity. The mother's declaration, one, one might call her, for, her final inv invitation. There are people who love adventure. And I tell them, it is these I call, and I tell them, I invite you to the great adventure. It is not a matter of repeating spiritually what others have done before us. For our adventure begins beyond that. It is a matter of a new creation, entirely new, with all the unforeseen events, the risks, the hazards it entails. It is a real adventure of which the goal is certain victory, but the road to which is unknown and must be made step by step in the unexplored. It is something that has never existed in this present universe and that will never be again in the same way. If this interests you, well, embark. What is awaiting you tomorrow, I couldn't say. You must leave behind all you have foreseen, all you have planned, all you have built up and start walking into the unknown, come what may. And that is that. And this is the mother's final message to mankind. In 1973, the mother passed away. It's the mother's Mahasamadhi. But she lives on with us, among us. And I think her experiment goes on everywhere across the world. I feel here, in this place, I think since the same experiment is continuing and it needs to be multiplied all over the world because it is only in this manner that that which tries to be born can find a critical mass through which the transformation of the world can take place. Thank you. Om Namo Bhagavate Om Anandamai Chaitanyamai Satyamai Parame Om Shanti Shanti Shanti